Okay, perfect. So, a very good evening to all of you, and uh, once again, a warm welcome to our uh, Roots and Roots Arda series. And uh, by now, just to inform you who are just here for the first time or about to listen to us for the first time, that this has been very specifically curated to have easygoing conversations, but without really compromising with the intellectual in depthness. And uh, today, we have the great pleasure. Uh, to have Ifat Nawaz with us. So Ifat, uh, I'm sure is quite a familiar name to the people who very strongly and firmly engages with the field of partition, especially the India-Bangladesh partition. I mean, there was a series of partitions for India-Bangladesh who engages with these histories and the philosophies and the cultures of this particular historical uh, historical moments uh, are very much familiar with the name. But just to do a basic formality, Ifat is from Bangladesh. Uh, and uh, I had the pleasure of uh, interacting with Ifat with the recent uh, Matruhumi Literature Festival in, in, in Kerala. And uh, I came across this fantastic book. So Ifat currently stays in uh, India, specifically in Pondicherry. She has been here in Pondicherry for quite some time. Um, and uh, I came across this fantastic work called Shurjo's Clan. And uh, I don't want to put spoilers out here. Those who have read, you all already know what a fantastic work it is. Those who haven't read, please, you are very warmly invited. If you are interested in narratives and partition this is one of the must read works of the contemporary times uh, obviously uh, we would be having conversations around shujo's clan for sure but uh, you know what we have conceptualized is to have a very detailed aspect how emotions uh, play a very important role when we engage with the narrative of partition i mean um, so, so, so to based on that, to start with the very, uh, you know, fundamental question, if I, and uh, I think that will sort of also invite the audience to feed into our uh, conversation as well. Um, what does, uh, you know, home, these, these concepts of being in home, being away from home, uh, the experiences of displacements, and uh, the experiences of being, you know, uh, you know, being in the space of, you know, refugee in one country, away from one, you know, away from the so-called homeland. Uh, how have these elements have emotionally impacted you, uh, not just as a person, but also eventually in shaping your uh, expressions in writing as well? If you can start with that, if I Sure. Thank you so much, Shion. You've been so kind <laughs> with your introduction. I hope I do justice. Um, so, you know, obviously, I think uh, the way everybody writes differently, and for me, the process of writing is very personal. So I draw from uh, not just mine, but people have seen. I think I am one of those people who are sponges for, uh, you know, in a room, I, I would probably... Uh, taken a lot of energy uh, just to sort of process emotions not just mine but the ones around me that's just how I am made so my family were uh, one of those who moved from West Bengal to East Bengal in 1947 my paternal side they and you know Shujo's clan is semi-autobiographical about 25 percent is you know auto semi that autobiographical element is there so you would find it in the book as well the the main character's family does the same and the maternal side, they uh, they were from uh, in Moshidabad, and my my grand my grandfather and my maternal side was a school teacher who was posted in Medinapur, and he did not want to leave the country. He India was you know his homeland, but I think one of the riots uh, post forty seven around fifty one or so 50, 1950 or so, he, they had to rush out there. You know unon as in like the where the cook the where you cook the food was still burning when they had to rush out with his eight children to Bangladesh and they were refugees, East Pakistan then. So both sides had carried this sort of um, emotional trauma with them. But I don't know if you notice, a lot of, uh, lot of narratives that exist about the Bengal partition are mostly from West Bengal, those who move from East to West. And of course, there's so many intellectuals who did move from East to West. But there's, there are very few uh, in fiction, especially, even in non, I mean, there are research that's been done, but, you know, from like a first person narrative or something like uh, stories of your grandfather and your grandmother, it doesn't exist yet. And there's a reason for that. And I personally, I when I was writing Shujo's Clan, I dug into that. Why was it that my grandparents spoke so little about 
this whole thing of moving, you know. Um, and there were few things. Uh, I think there was a fear of being othered. As you move into a new country, you've already lost so much and you've lost to homelands and you want to just kind of start fresh. There was a rush of trying to uh, fit in, you know, and not be called a certain thing. We were already called ghotis, a pot, you know, so you were our, you know, sort of dignity was then summed up in that pot. Uh, <laughs> and I, I know the same thing exists in, as Bangal, you know, in Kolkata. But like, I think Bangal has a pride to it and ghoti is sort of like a you know, shrunk into a little thing. And uh, so there was that, sh that shrunken feeling that existed while they moved and um, even changing an ac the accent, you know. Um, certain words are, are uttered differently in East Bengal and so forth. We don't speak the dialect, you know, our, our uh, the West Bengalis are more shuddho bangla bhashai kotha boli. So those things had to be sort of learned very quickly and the food habits, everything, everything. So, and throughout the 1950s and 60s, then there was this other other war to walk into, a silent war, right? Because Pakistan and East pa West Pakistan, East Pakistan were going through their own uh, tension. And um, that was overpowering. And I think the families we, who moved sort of went into that flow. It was not at all settling for them. You know, it was a constant movement towards a liberation war so that... 20, 23 years until the liberation war happened, it wasn't like they had peace. So a lot of what was, you know, uh, could have been written, warned, could have been experienced, warned, because the kids grew up, who grew up in that then East Pakistan, like my uncles or their friends or my father, they were too busy figuring out how to liberate this land and how to reclaim Bangla, Bangladesh, you know? So all of this leaves us in one place that they were so in it, so in the middle of this churning that their emotions were very intense and very potent, but they themselves couldn't see it because they were in, in too close to the forest, right? Then the next generation, us, who were still called ghotis in school uh, and non, you know, I'm not just talking about ghotis, I'm also talking about those who are uh, actually from East Bengal, but specifically just talk, talking about me who did, or my family did go through the partition. I can say this much that our parents just passed down these memories, these thoughts, these ideas onto us without so much talking about it. You know, it was almost a non-verbal communication. It was through the books they gave us on 71. It was the stories I saw of the partition that my father might have given to me or my grandmother mistakenly told me, you know, about a migration story although she would not talk so much about it, or when an old trunk was open, suddenly would find things that weren't found in East Bengal, but only found in specific places in West Bengal. And they were like clues that were just coming out for a child that were beyond the reality that we were given. And it became very magical for us, you know, and with it were these trapped emotions, not just in their bodies that they had gone through the trauma and grief of it. I mean, now we talk about these things a lot more. Mental health is a thing now. We talk about concentrating on the body. But these people, our, our grandparents and parents did not face those things. But they were very heavy with it. Um, and we grew up around them. So obviously we were affected. So it was material things as well as this immaterial, very subtle things, emotions, memories that were passed down. And uh, that's what we inherited, uh, my generation in Bangladesh. And once we figured out, you know, in your 20s is when you kind of start th thinking, what's wrong with me? You know, <laughs> it takes a while to figure out why am I like this? And you start questioning your uh, past and the people in your family and your ancestors and your nation and the conditioning. I think that's when I realized that I was carrying emotions that were not just mine, but others um, that were uh, even collective you know, a collective thing of our my, the consciousness I grew up in in, in Bangladesh, the environmental consciousness is very potent. Um, so all of that, and because I relate through emotion the best, I could only write, you know, using that psychological, those psychological spaces. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ifat, for this really uh, very, very thought-provoking response. Because when I was listening to you, I was also... And, and, and since my, uh, both my, on the paternal side and the maternal side, my uh, uh, grandparents were born and brought up in different parts of Bangladesh and uh, they migrated, 
if I am, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm using the correct word because these are so much, you know, fraught with contestations. But uh, when they migrated from Bangladesh at different points of time, uh, uh, you know, sometimes uh, I mean, one group came in 1940s at that point of partition. One was in the 1970s. Uh, obviously, it was all sort of fraught with violence, uh, losses, um, sacrifices. But at the same time. You know, it was a very deep emotional process. Um, again, when you were talking about the whole question of, like, the war of liberation, uh, when we talk about the term liberation, uh, like, this, this whole process is actually so much transitional in nature, because especially uh, so much of life losses, losses of land, losses of roots, losses of cultures, losses of families, so many different levels and you know, layers of losses that families and individuals and communities have undergone over the process of time. And the experiences for sure have been very traumatic, which have been sort of intergenerationally passed from one space to another. And, and you know, this is also what I find is a very contested process. Like on the one side, I want to have a better life. If I imagine I want to have a better life, where I want to embrace this whole process of mobility and transition that is to move from one place to another. But also there are moments when I want to remain rooted in my spaces, which I'm leaving because I'm so emotionally attached to that space. So there is a feeling of remaining stuck to one space as well. And it is a very complex process. And I find this... Um, I find this aspect very strong in your work, Shujo Scan, as well. I mean, again, I'll come to Shujo Scan very specifically at a bit later point of time, but I'm just touching on that because, you know, this negotiation, contestation, transition, um, you know, uh, what is what is where the roots lies? Are the roots multi-rooted? Uh, can the roots grow from one space and multiply into another geographical space? It's so many elements are like playing in between us, especially when the human figures interact with the spiritual figures. And especially when we read the whole narrative through the lens of the spiritual figures, right? So, I mean, how did that element, like these sort of complex contestations and negotiations, came to your uh, mind when you were conceptualizing the plot and the idea of the Shudra's clan? If you can share a bits and pieces with us. Sure. So you were just to sort of repeat or understand, you're talking about the, like the realm of magic, magic that I brought in, the spirituality, or spirit, not spiritual. Yeah, there is a bit of spirituality, but the spirit world, the unknown world that I have there to sort of explain that connection of roots, if what I is that what I understand? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So like I was saying a little bit ago, you know, the Dhaka I grew up in, um, even I felt that about Kolkata when we would visit once a year, you know, around Pujo, and um, similar energies, that there was a, so much past that was there. And for a child, I think it was we were very lucky to have grown up in, a, in that time, because I'm not sure if that sort of, that energy is gone, I feel. And recently I wrote a piece about this, that maybe there were too many Kalboishakis which have passed through our Bengal and has wiped out those spirits that existed when we were born. You know, I'm born in the late 70s, about eight years after the war, seven years, eight years after the war. And those who were born in the early 80s also have a very similar, um, you know, sort of feeling about all this. So one of the reason what... Um, why I chose this element of, you know, the unknown or the spirit is because of um, those who died during 71. And even during the partition, there's a character in my book called Shantori who commits suicide, as you know, you've read the book, jumps into the well because she's absolutely heartbroken after uh, moving to East Bengal, right? So the, the, those are there, those, those sort of abrupt endings are there and those endings actually existed in the land I grew up in Dhaka. There were so many who were killed and so many who weren't buried or burnt, you know? So there were areas we'd walk, walk in and my parents would say, oh, this is where the mass grave is or this is where we had piles of people, you know, rotting. You know, this is where maybe a friend had crawled out of 
uh, out of the dead bodies because he he survived like the shooting and he just pretended to be dead and these were very real so as a child you could actually see it because our imagination is much more large when we were kids you know and we could actually picture that and with it they gave us images anyway like i was saying we were given pictures books with uh, you know the intellectual killings you know where we shouldn't be watching this or looking at some photos like that but they were very visible so i think as children we just accepted the fact that our the deads were living with us they were so present because our parents could not tell us a story without going back to 71 or going back to 47 or or you know some reference would inevitably come in uh sometimes mutely sometimes just like as a by the way you know not even directly so and the houses we grew up not just mine most of the houses we, that people grew up in kids grew up in there were pictures of those who died during the war because every household had lost somebody and these you know these were all framed and these people were looking down at us you know daughters and sons of different ages and their eyes would follow us around you know and so it was like a very prominent entity in the homes and i think at some point i had started talking to my uncles who had died in the war because you would see they seem so alive right and they, their presence seems so alive in the study where i used to do my homework and things so uh, so when i was writing shooter's clan the first draft of it was not what you read read uh, it was actually something very different i wanted the main character was santori and she had six arms uh, like a goddess and i was questioning the fact that how goddesses have you know multiple limbs and we look at them as an empowered being and very powerful but there's also the baggage no there's the heaviness of a of the, the the little body carrying so many arms so each arm represented some a story of the past so it was a very heavy way of telling the same story and it was about 100000 words with all these characters that you read in shurjo plus 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 and there was a lot more about the partition i just poured it out uh, into that draft and when i did there was more spirit in it and there was more darkness in it and there were more stories of things that were uh, perhaps repeated not repeated in the sense that we know the stories already you know maybe i have read it somewhere else or you have read it somewhere else so it was like that and to make it light i had to create this new version of shooter's clan it took me a year and more and the way i could do it was the spirit that are there are actually jovial right like they're happy in many ways they are not sad spirits they are young spirits and they are they're all young they are all below 30 and so to think about them that these people who died were actually quite young so there were lots of unmet desires and lots of dreams and those dreams are what we grew up with those dreams are what the now bangladesh is made out of actually you know the songs we hear in our still hear in our radios and television are often written by those who were killed by during the war so so celebrated so i think those elements had to come into my book because i grew up with only that and so and i believed in all of it and i still do even though i shunned it you know i moved to us where i think the space for uh, so called spirits where uh, you know there's so much space that the spirits disappear <laughs> but you know i moved back to bangladesh for 5 years for work and i again felt that energy um so that's the reason why they were there and when you are a spirit you are free to go anywhere but yet they still stayed in that bengal you know uh, they were because they it's almost like they didn't know they died it was so sudden that's what i felt you know that's what it, what it felt like when we were kids that they were all sort of souls who didn't leave yet because they were so invested in this uh, victory awesome i mean i mean when i was listening uh, you know just just yeah. trying to uh, you know sort of understand the different perspectives of spirit that you uh, were sharing and that you have brought it also in your work shooter's clan um i was just wondering to also ask you just flashed across my mind is this is this also a reason that apart from the reasons that you shared that why you have spiritual characters like spirits from the spirit characters from the spirit world rather i mean rather than saying spiritual characters let's say characters from the spirit world you have so many characters from the spirit world does it is it also a way of reminding the masses that if we have to celebrate history we also have to take into account the diverse 
roots, the pains and the agonies from where histories have emerged. Because, and why I'm saying this is because this is not, it's also kind of challenge that I encounter when I see the blunt celebration of patriotism in India and in many other parts of the world as well. Like we think that it is all about playing loud music and singing a few patriotic songs or maybe delivering a few speeches on designated days and times, and that makes you feel patriotic. But then in the process of often doing that sort of jingoistic celebration, if I put it in that way, it often happens that, um, you know, like uh, we, we do forget the real roots, the real perspectives, the real dimensions, and, and the pains and the agonies that once our ancestors have undergone to create a more or less safe space for us where we are existing today. I mean, they're also, they're ridden with many challenges, but it is much better than what they've undergone at one point of time. Do you think invoking the spiritual character uh, like so strongly is also a way of reminding people like how, if you want to really celebrate and really acknowledge the works of the ancestors, how it needs to be done? Um, you know, I wouldn't dare uh, <laughs> go there in the sense, you know, a reminder because I, I, I invite you to visit Bangladesh at any time you want to come. I'll be very happy to host you. Um, if you go there, you'll see that the celebration is always on of history and past. The reason behind bringing in this sort of storytelling for me was actually uh, to connect with the new generation who have now shut their ears to this history and rightfully so it's so repeated it's so much so talked about everywhere we look it's there you know and so at some point in the 90s the kids who were born after 2000 you know who are now in their 20s right they just stopped they just roll their eyes and I understand it's the same thing and it's in textbook uh, edited in the way that maybe the then government wanted it to be told and it changed to whatever you know so it's just very like clinical and uh, and so they kind of shut their ears. And I realized this um, when there was a terrible incident that had happened in Bangladesh in, in 2016, when, uh, when then like five kids from Dhaka and a few from village of kids, few kids from Dhaka and few from the villages of near Bangla, near all around Bangladesh left and joined ISIS, you know, and came back to Dhaka and killed our very own in a in a bakery where foreigners frequented and so did people like us you know it was one of those more uh, trendy-ish places and uh, you know a friend was killed because she refused to recite uh, the kalma because we are bengali first you know that's always been our uh, you know identity and so it was very odd that these kids killed them 19 people and then um, they killed. They, they were all. They also died, and it was just so tragic. It was a fall night, July first of two thousand sixteen, and I felt, and so did others, my around my generation, that we failed somewhere, that we were so busy celebrating or walking away or whatever, processing our own issues about the war and our past and how spe how special we were made to feel our generation that you guys are the children of victory. When it came to transferring the same energy to the next generation, we really didn't do a good job. Our parents kept on repeating the same thing. Obviously, they got bored, the kids, and we sort of checked out somewhere. You know, we were just too busy with our own selfish needs. And so my whole, you know, there was this goal of writing Shujo in a way where it would speak to the now generation and um, in a way where... It, it's there aren't you read the book there aren't a lot of there are references to things that happen but it's a backdrop literally it's not like uh, okay in 26 March da, da 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 you know or on 16 December yes there are references they're more about what happened to people around than the history itself because we can google so I had to keep that in mind that a, it had to be interesting and told from something they can relate to which I think is that emotional space and that spirit space because Dhaka still is very magical and anybody who is aware will feel that magic and that intoxication without reading, without, you know, being told anything. There is a special energy there. Bangladesh has that. Um, so that's there. And so my whole goal was to speak to the generation now without making it a heavy book, without having too many characters, but focusing on people like them almost, you know, 
who wants to be heroes or who's scared of war or who you know who really are nostalgic and overly sort of uh sensitive like shantori um you know they're the the sort of theme of river that still is so big in our country our uh, both of our countries you know so things like that um so those were the elements i wanted to bring in nature emotions and spirit to which is universal and that was the main reason why and yes you're right it was because i wanted to speak to the generation in a way where it was more interesting hopefully than how we have been telling the story um now you know i mean we we will again come back to this conversation of um, the whole question of politics of representation and uh, understanding uh, so, sort of sensitizing the new generation with the diversities of histories and cultures which are sort of sadly which they are very oblivious of um i will kind of take a slight departure from this conversation about politics towards something which is again related to it but then the whole element of objects um this is another something that has always fascinated me uh, in general when i have always uh, uh, indulged myself in different perspectives of partition uh migration refugee crisis home displacements and all of these questions uh in fact at the very uh, beginning you mentioned very uh, very warmly about the trunk that when your grandmother will open up a trunk you know it is also a whole uh load of memories would sort of emerge from that the how did this trunk appear what are the objects in the trunk why certain objects are there why certain objects are not there and also these elements of objects these physical objects also appear very firmly uh in your in your work shujo scan as well you know people what are being left behind what are being carried forward uh and it has always been in general being a part of because even i have heard stories from my uh, uh you know uh, grandparents as well that they they would share how when they just uh, you know left bangladesh and came to uh, obviously it was not like west bengal west bengal but let's say it was like sort of you know still kind of bengal and all of those dim- dimensions when they came to uh, you know this side of uh, bengal let's say in that way uh, they say that they carried certain uh, very particular objects like they would carry some very basic spices um they would carry some uh, you know certain specific utensils which they've thought is is very rooted to their uh, culinary cultures uh, they would try to carry certain seeds of certain plants so so that they can kind of start planting it wherever they are sort of relocated so that at least they can remain associated with some elements of their roots they may carry some idols of you know religious entities which have been close to them so in this way you know they carry so many some kind of clothes etc um i mean how to to you personally and also maybe your personally putting it widely into your experiences of uh, you know uh, knowing it from your parents and maybe from your grandparents how does objects feature in in shaping your whole understanding of uh, partition narratives i mean obviously with respect to your work but also in general if you can share some perspectives and stories about that may i go beyond partition actually please please do please do okay so you know um i was i worked for two different uh, humanitarian crises one with the rohingya crisis for 6 months during the first response and right before that in nigeria with the boko haram caused you know, displaced you know the issues of displacement in borno in northeast nigeria and in both places of course there were people who were who had lost their homes um and even working in development i would come upon a lot it was a climate change projects i worked with and so there were lots of uh, displacement cases that i would see you know people losing home finding try to figure out where to be and us building homes for them so it was always interesting to see what people grabbed when they left you know especially in a rush so uh you know th- like during the rohingya crisis my one of my friend munam wasif he's done an exhibition actually recently a couple of years ago he did a uh, research on this people grab their not theirs but their fathers uh you know uh education certificate like very random things that were important to them in that rush you know or like a photograph of their marriage 
maybe not not the money that were sitting there but you know things that were just like pieces of things a comb um a favorite you know like a favorite sort of um uh, mirror like the pieces that were there a letter you know uh, very like not at all materially lucrative things in many ways right they were all emotional attachment and i we had the same thing in my uh, my grandparents from my paternal side were lucky they could exchange houses they brought a lot of things over and but the way they kept them was very interesting you know everything was locked up my 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 grandmother my taku mama my dadi she kept everything locked up and it was her habit because she wanted to preserve everything and this went beyond and it wasn't just in my house any house that had you know had to migrate were like that they just want to preserve the past so we never used these things you know maybe once a year she would bring out like a nice brass something or other or we'd suddenly see one you know beautiful uh, maybe a mirror with like gold plating or something or the 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 uh, the beds we slept on were like these very beautiful wooden high beds you know those were brought over and they were kept so well and she she even had this habit of if we got something new she would put it in the same sort of almira she's like it's for later so we never enjoyed the present and i think that's something that happens when you migrate you forget to enjoy the present because you feel like it might get lost if you don't preserve it in a different way so you almost just take it away from yourself and you just stare at it like oh i have this and i'll keep it forever and hopefully i don't have to leave this home it, it's preserved in the safe space so she had this tendency and i've seen it in others as well who have gone through the migration so this refugee crisis taught me that i myself i feel like i wanted to go through this process uh myself so i had a very nomadic life for a long time because of my jobs and i move a lot around the globe and i would have and i still have it i'll show you this robinnath thakur that my uh, one of my ma- my mom's mama made you know she was he was an artist and he made it out of a wood so it's like pieces like this or i have like this angel that's like you know and they have been traveling with me forever everywhere i went there's small little things and i'd bring them over and i'd keep them wherever i was to remind me that this was home that this was what would ground me uh, i wanted to maybe and the, maybe the reason why i went into refugee crisis was also to learn uh, what it felt like to not have uh, you know not to be kicked out or to, to be forced out or to find a new home my family like many other families in bangladesh who did migrate from uh, one place to another keeps migrating you know uh in the 1960s they moved to part of them moved to the us a new migration happened and so it's almost like once you're displaced you're always displaced it's very interesting you know nothing can be home again because they were born with the sense of homelessness and objects like this the sari which has been passed down from my many many generations this time i was in bangladesh and my uh, maternal grandmother gave me a gift of a trunk that was brought from kolkata in 1951 a very simple green trunk but to her she was keeping it for me in the sundarbans where she lives to and i had brought it back to dhaka you know everybody wondered what i was doing with it but you know to me it's precious why you know it's this one thing that she has kept for so so long and all her life's memories are in it so is this objects that are immaterial like it doesn't have value to anyone else but yet it it's so heavy with so much more substance that we can only explain it when we talk about or write about it because you know to the plain eye it's just it's nothing it might not even be a pretty sight it might be such a simple thing so i think you know investing investigating these things are very interesting in in places and seeing and i hope someone does this research on objects that are carried <laughs> no absolutely i mean uh, I, i know ornob has also a few few perspectives to share but you know prior to going to ornob and uh, also the rest of the people i mean this is actually what you mention is uh, you know these uh, these are some of the objects which may not have any uh, uh, materialistic commercial value but in the process of not having this materialistic and commercial values it's actually so much valuable which is beyond this whole concept of weighing everything in especially in today's capitalistic society like we have weigh everything in terms of its materialistic value in terms of its commercial value but how many of us really engage with the question of emotional values of objects 
and um, and uh, you know in in that case what you have shown about you know the the uh, you know tagore's image and the other other objects that you have shown is actually you know it carries so many stories so much of emotion so much of narratives that are sort of very deeply rooted you know in your understanding of your society in remembering and uh, you know remembering your roots and perspectives of your childhood memories of your family memories and perspectives i'm sure it's a it's a like a never ending conversation we will surely continue but you know uh, now i'll actually hand it over to orno baby orno if you have a few perspectives to share questions to ask please please feel free to ask actually thank you madam actually it is very interesting the way you talk about the relationship between memory and materiality but my question is about spectral voices in your novel uh, just a minute someone is trying to join in yeah so uh, the way you talked about the spectral voices have you used those voices to reclaim the past history i mean there were lots of past that were never historicized past as evidence the way we live those things are never historicized that things are never recorded within the discourse of history so do you think this spectral voices can be a important tool to reclaim those pasts the way we live our life you read through your imagine is that yeah, like more yeah, or less, yeah more or less so like can you specifically tell me which voices you're speaking of so i can no, you hear mm. you were talking about the voices the spectral voices who are dead now but right. they are speaking i mean do right. you think those spectral voices can be an important tool to reclaim the past the past that have never been historicized i mean you know we cannot accommodate everything right of course of course i think uh, i think my fear of uh, I don't know if I was reclaiming anything. I think I was. I wanted to. Part of me definitely wanted to, um, like immortalize certain stories. And I think my uncle's stories very closely resemble what is written about Shoku and Biku in the book. And the two two brothers who die. In fact, I didn't even change their nicknames. They, that is actually their names, right? Um, so, I mean, for a while, I actually felt like their spirits were living with me, and uh, they wanted to tell the story. And the story, I. made up is actually i i made it up you know in many in many ways because i was never told fully really what had happened so it was like connecting with something that was beyond me to understand the pieces that i was given it was like solving a puzzle uh was it about reclaiming anything i'm not sure but i wanted to step into their shoes and understand their mentality when it happened as you know the older brother in the book um he wanted to be a hero always he was born pre 47 he saw the partition he saw real heroes in front of him he was very charged he was just waiting for a war to break out so he could be in the front line whereas the younger brother did not want to be a hero he was a sensitive soul who just wanted to be in the backdrop and feel things but you know he was pushed into it i wanted to I don't know if I want to the word reclaim is appropriate but I wanted to represent those stories also because I'm pretty sure there were many who had to become a mukti yodha who just happened to be there and they had no choice you know um and we obviously look up to them but you know that grief or that that um sort of like re- not regret but the, those those special places where you're like you just happened to be there and the circumstances brought you into where you ended up being I wanted to talk about those people uh which you know we don't talk about much so yeah you're right in that sense um there was a reason for that and also the female voice is quite strong in the book as you know uh equally strong or even more strong i would say and i wanted to tell stories of folks like shantori who were young and you know moved and who had no voice right i mean at that age a girl doesn't speak and back in those days i mean she was almost you know she didn't speak to people as much as she did to nature right so i wanted to uh, also use her spirit to finally give her that voice and a mature slowly maturing voice from a child to you know almost a teenager to like a mature voice so that was a transition i wanted to make through the book as well yeah that is what i was thinking about actually when you say something to literature you don't have the burden to either prove or disprove it because you are not claiming it to be history still you are recounting his or her stories 
So that is the interesting part. That's what I was thinking about. So my second uh, question is a bit personal. What does West Bengal mean to you now as the post memory generation? What does West Bengal mean? Does it still feel like home or has it been culturally otherized? Can you please share your perspectives on that? Sure. Uh, you know, it is like for me, it's always been a very romantic space going to Kolkata, going to Medinapur in the, on the train. I haven't yet been to Murshidabad. I really want to. That's where my maternal grandfather is from. Um, and, you know, Jashore Road in Bangladesh goes into uh, India, right? And my grandmother lives very close to that border. So it's like we were always, I grew up with the feeling that we were very close we were very almost the same the bengal partition of 1905 was never supposed to be permanent right it just happened to be because of certain politics in 47 so those things i was aware of now when i go to kolkata just like dhaka dhaka feels closer because i grew up there of course i was born there but there's always a bit of pain also you know i feel uh, somewhere because it has changed and there is a bit of stagnancy somewhere where I feel like we're holding on to these old homes, but not with care. You know, we're, we're showing our heritage, but not with love. And so I see those and I feel a little sad because my father was a diehard fan of Kolkata. He was conceived there, according, according to my grandma. So he had this tan, you know, a pull of for Kolkata. And I also was born with that. But now when I go, I feel very emotional. I'm an emotional person anyway, um, you know, overly so. And I have to sort of cut the cord very quickly after I'm done with whatever work I've gone because I feel like it will take me over and I won't be able to figure out what I feel. Like I'll just come back with emotions and energies that I don't know what to do with um, because there is, I feel like it's a stagnant pool of energy that needs to be released. I don't know if that makes sense. It's a very subtle way of explaining what I feel. But yeah, that's what I feel. Thank you. Now <laughs> sure. I would like to open the floor for others with Sandra's permission. Yeah, if anyone has any question, please feel free to ask. Unmute yourself and you can directly ask. Hello, good evening, everyone. So I have two questions to ask you. So, in I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Please go on. Yeah, okay. So, in my undergrad, I had an elective paper of partition literature. I am a student from Delhi University, and I've been studying partition literature for one more than one semester. So, I have two questions. The first one would be, um, whenever we talk about the, the post, I mean, the discussions that people have had, of partition or uh, be it uh, 47 or 71, 72, whenever people have discussions, there's this idea of evasion of the actual act of partition. So whenever the question arises, like, how did you move? Yeah, what happened on the exact place or at the exact moment? People almost trade around that area. Like It's like beating around the bush concept and they don't really um, answer the actual question. So how uh, so like uh, you told your family your parents uh, uh, um, coming from the place itself so what was it like talking to them about the event of partition like when they described the place pre-partition place was it an idyllic description or was it like a normal place that we would talk about right now so was was a kind of romanticization associated with the place on its own or was it subconsciously done? Like, I hope my question is understandable. Yes, completely understandable. Um, so it was never very clear, like just what you said, you know, exactly that. They were all, always beating around the bushes when it comes to details. And that's why I had to imagine so much of it from the pieces I had heard from not just my grandparents' parents, but also other uh, other families, you know, like us, um, well, let it be 71 or 47, it was more through like very sort of uh, random, like not at all uh, related to the partition, but suddenly like maybe a sentence would come out where it was a big clue to something bigger, you know, like, like something else would, like, for example, there were so much unrest in 45, 46 as well. There were droughts and there were, you know, people were dying on the streets and all these things happened, right, before the partition in Calcutta. So, and there were memories that I, 
that my grandmother had of those things and she would suddenly maybe say like one thing and then she would shut up she would just go quiet and then it was up to me to like remember it for the rest of my life to you know i didn't know i was doing that to write about it later right and a lot of that did come into the book the first draft and i didn't follow it through in the second because it was just becoming so heavy because those memories were so um i think you know when you when you have when something like a crisis happens you often want to forget what has happened i don't think any of those memories were good for either sides east or west and uh so it was just like knowing you have to depart and probably the looming uh idea of leaving something that you always thought you were was going to be your own and then finally leaving you just didn't want to look back you didn't know how to talk about it which language to use and that's why they they went so mute so it was very similar for my story however when we went back to kolkata every year we would go back to the house that they had left we were lucky enough to go back to it still there two people didn't speak of it interestingly and so but it was more about more some from observing uh their face facial expressions their moods how they changed that uh we could gather perhaps how uncomfortable things had become for them to just you know beat around the bush about it yeah uh thank you for answering that now this brings me to my second question which is more or less related so uh, how have you been able to differentiate between the memory of of your own and of the memory that has been given to you by your forefathers if i say so because the idea of um, intergenerational trauma is not not very far from the idea of um, the uh, post memory or the belated memory that comes with the idea of partition and it is um, subconsciously inherited by the descendant and the idea of displacement of one's own memory i mean they all go together so how have you while writing or while thinking about the place dhaka let's say for example how have you been able to distinguish between your own memory and the memory that was provided to you by them that's a really good question interesting <laughs> i think uh there was a lot of conversations in between about it i used to write a column for about 10 years for the daily star newspaper where i would ex- when i was living in the us so i was sort of separated from bangladesh for a long time you know i grew up uh, i was there for about 20 years in the us on and off 18 15 years straight and then went back uh, to you know uh, so during that time i could explore uh, a lot of my own feelings about dhaka which were more uh, poetic and nostalgic to do with the city itself and less to do with the history so the like spatial memories and like the rain and the monsoon and those feelings they were, they were mine they were very much nature oriented or like like i said space oriented environment oriented so those were my own ideas and thoughts and memories when i look back and then and then there were memories that were i also felt while i was away from dhaka that were actually not mine you know and i didn't know you know how sometimes when you uh, have deja vus or when you have a memory and you you weren't sure when you especially happens when you're young you don't know if it was a dream or if it really happened you know i don't know if all of you have experienced this but i know that some people have so there were lots of things like that maybe something i had heard or seen and maybe not even seen but it was so visual and it wasn't even mine maybe it was something that was shown to me or i maybe i pretended to sleep and i didn't and i overheard a conversation so those thing travel into a child's brain right so i feel like though they were those and i knew from the quality of it that it couldn't have been mine i couldn't have had such uh such co- you know coherent thoughts at that age to make sense of it or that vocabulary couldn't have been mine it sounds different from my own vocabulary and my own learning so there were those things that um while i was writing shujo i think fi- i figured out funnily um i am a like i try to be a spiritual person i live in in kondichiri uh, i work for the shravinda ashram shravinda has a, a very strong effect on me and uh, interestingly i can just say this much meditation has been a big part of my journey that i you know wrote about the love affair of babu and bella part of the book you know the two 
that the children of migration they both were the, both the parents were pregnant with the mothers and they are born in dhaka later at the um, and their love story and i created that out of like nothing right and later on when my mom read it she was like this is exactly what had happened between my father and her like one page of it was just just that you know how they fell in love and it was really crazy for me to understand that because she how that happened because i wanted to talk about shukanto of course there was research done as well you know shukanto uh, was born august 15th and he died 3 months before or 2 months before the uh, the independence happened and yeah he was such a strong voice back then no like he spoke of like all the pain of people and he didn't get to see a liberated india and so uh, you know the character of babu is called shukanto by bella the one that the girl that falls in love with him and and my i didn't know that my father was called Shuk- my mom called him shukanto you know so there were these things which i'm not sure if i heard it when i was young but she never mentioned it to me and he never did these were all his their secrets they had burned all their love letters so i never read them so you know you just i think that it sounds crazy but i do think thoughts come from outside and enter you <laughs> and you just it's very hard to figure out what's yours and your what's not it takes a lot of time but i i can only say that the nature oriented the environment oriented pieces and thoughts and emotions are mine and uh the ones that come that seem very sort of surreal almost aren't mine as as mine i should say i don't know if that makes sense thank you for answering yeah it does thank you for answering that Yeah thank you so much Ifat for these uh, and also Pragya for this wonderful questions and Arnob as well um i don't know uh, we still have some time uh, i don't know if anybody has any for the for the question but i mean as one thinks about the question i really can't hold back myself from saying that this whole you know this whole perspective of um talking through the spirits i mean spirits of independent spirits of sacrifice um spirits of anti colonial war spirits of border disputes is such a powerful a uh, tool of expression is such a powerful as orno was also talking about being a tool of expression being a tool of reunderstanding histories i mean it was also reminding me briefly about uh, i mean those who are a bit familiar with the bengali movies the bhutir bhobishat movies right i mean which is again very specifically not about partition partition but then this whole concept of uh, spirits speaking for themselves the importance of you know uh, you know spirits as a metaphor of remembering our histories spirits is a metaphor of dreaming about the past probably of which we have not been practically a part of it but which has been existent in spiritual emotional and in a lot of genetic ways in our existence through stories through dreams through narratives um uh, through through silence conversations with oneself and with others and uh, as you if i mean you rightly mentioned that you know a lot of things we uh, don't concretely hear from people in terms of words but they sort of um it's it's very difficult to it's a very complex element to explain it's 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 very difficult to put it in the right words but it's kind of you know sort of feeds into our emotions so deeply that we often build those connections uh, which are very intangible uh, but they sort of so spiritually deep and uh, you know engaging that we sort of build those connections and where you know we end up creating this overlaps without being conscious that we have ge- you know generating this overlaps and it is such a fantastic aspect to understand these very uh, you know deeply sensitive aspects like partition and displacements and separation and uh, you know at least going back to our roots so i i really wanted to share share this with you and uh, it doesn't seem like anybody is having any other question so uh maybe i would like to you know invite orno to just you know say a few concluding words and then we can wrap up this conversation oh sorry uh, rabia has her hand up yes please go ahead rabia thank you very much i'm sorry for waiting till the end but the conversation was so interesting i couldn't interrupt um hi everyone so in light of what you guys were talking about uh, especially uh in relation to migration you guys said that migration often means loss of cultures and ideologies and i do agree but in a more positive light we could say that migration also brings in the melting pot in a country 
So as opposed to us, you know, people who have migrated, as being called Bangals or Ghotis, do you think being um, a, someone who has migrated to a different country, it makes us more capable or confident, for the lack of a better word? Do you think it, it shapes us up to be a more defined personality just because we have migrated from one country to the other? Um, yeah, I think it gives us a chance to reinvent ourselves, right? And then there's the resilience part. But it also depends on what context you're walking into. That That's a big thing, right? So if you're migrating to U.S. with a green card or Canada or some European or Australian places, you, you have that, you know, you know you're going to go and you are secured. But if you're going Absolutely. there as, you know, as a refugee or how you're entering a place, what uncertainties you have. Every migration has uncertainties less or more so all of that matters and then it is obviously it will test our resilience we will also go into our survival mode for a long time you know it just happens we will be in the survival mode, mode until we are confident to not be in our survival mode because it's like we're animals in the end of the day you know we have to use our instincts to figure out what does this space uh, have that are threats for us or good for us and pick and choose so i think it's very interesting question and i think we do have the chance to reinvent ourselves either we uh you know sort of become a part of a flock or we fight or we you know rise and whatever it is whether our survival technique is we we, we follow that and i think that's that's the way it moves <laughs> if that makes sense thank you Okay, uh, so I would like to finish this conversation by drawing on what Sayonda actually pointed out, Bhutar Bhubish. So actually that reminds me of an interesting aspect. I mean, the intimate connection between spectrality and the past. When in Bengali, when you say both, you are meaning both spectre and the past. And spectre is a thing of the past, yet it lives in the present. So for me, it's basically the present and the presence of the past. So that's the interesting connection I find. So with this uh, aspect, I'd like to bring this conversation to an end. If uh, someone has any question, you are seeking raise. Otherwise, that's it for the day. Then it was a very interesting conversation. Yes. Before yeah, I just on. I just want to say one thing that you know I think. Um, thank you so much. This was so fun. <laughs> yeah. It was a great conversation. I loved it. Uh, the one thing that I do hope that the current generation uh, will do, uh, you know, no matter how much we uh, talk about it and, and all this and reclaim and we use these big words um, or we walk away from it, it will always creep up, you know, if it's not resolved. So I hope mm -hmm. that one day or other, all of us can look at these things, conditionings, I know in India it exists just as much as in Bangladesh where there are issues that are still, we still hold people as enemies or we still look at an idea, we are stuck with the, or what our grandparents thought about certain uh, people or things. I hope we can all question these as we come to it and resolve these parts in us so that we are more light. Um, so that's, that's, that was a reason why I wrote Shurjo. So I just wanted to say that before we end. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ifa. Thank you so much, all of you uh, who, have, who have been there. Uh, uh, I'm sure th those who have not asked questions, I'm, I'm sure has been thinking a lot around these elements because as we always see that emotional aspects are very difficult to process through. It's, it's, very, it's not just like a word or a perspective. It's also very entangled with our, you know, daily ways of our existence. So uh, thanks once again, Ifa. Thanks once thank again, you. all of you for being a part of this conversation and uh, we will put up the recording very soon uh, on the on the youtube archive and we'll share it widely with all of you uh, feel free to you know share it with your peers and I i'm sure this is a topic that sort of touches a lot of emotional and other forms of chords within us so let us keep the conversation going and uh, wherever you are based have a nice morning day evening and night thank you and please take care and stay thank, well. you. thank you thank you thank you bye bye thank you bye